the more we have in this collective unity against the, the excess of these governments, the better off chance we have fighting it. You know, if we're a small group of a thousand people, we're pretty easy to stamp out. When we're 30% of the population, good luck. Hello, and welcome back to the Coin Stories podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Brunel, and we are talking to some of the leading voices in Bitcoin, their backstories, how they were first introduced to Bitcoin, and their take on what the cryptocurrency offers. I'm excited to share my guest for this episode is Dan Held. In addition to being a huge voice in the Bitcoin space on Twitter, Dan also works as the growth lead at crypto exchange Kraken. Dan is an entrepreneur who built some of the most popular early crypto products, including ChangeTip, which was acquired by Airbnb, and ZeroBlock, acquired by Blockchain.com. Dan has been in this space for a very long time and even shared some tips on how to grow your social media platforms. Here's Dan on his backstory and philosophy on Bitcoin. Dan, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I want to start at the very beginning, kind of get your origin story. So you're originally from Texas, right? Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Natalie. And uh, being originally from Texas, I, uh, it, I'm one of the few Texans who got Bitcoin early on. You know, it's a kind of a wild journey that led me out to San Francisco. Um, I started to get into Bitcoin in 2012. So in 2012, I had a buddy pay me back with uh, for a beer with a, one of those Casatius coins, those gold coins that you see in every news article, the really shiny ones. Yeah, I actually had to Google what a Casatius coin was when you talked about this with uh, with Peter McCormick on his podcast because I had no idea what a Casatius coin was. I've obviously seen them, but I didn't know that it was a physical token that had Bitcoin. Yeah, everyone's seen them in the news articles. That's why I bring it up because it's so shiny and visually compelling that I think that's why they use it, right? If you read an article by Forbes, Wall Street Journal, anywhere, you're going to see that shiny Bitcoin because it, <laughs> it's an easier way to represent Bitcoin than some esoteric data, right? Yeah. Um, so I got paid. And I think back then that was a very important way to bridge the analog to digital world. I mean, this was 2012. That's a long time ago. Um, iPhones had just come out a few years before that. So, you know, so this is... This is a long, long time ago, and, and right now we're in such a digital world, it's hard to remember that more physical world back then. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm 33, and I grew up with cassette tapes. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think our generation was the first to really bridge that analog to digital, and I think that was, I was one of the first age groups to really get Bitcoin, being old enough to have money to invest in it, be old enough to understand it, but at the same time, be young enough to be digitally native to understand this new digital currency, this new digital world that was being created. Well, wait, so, before you before you get to that moment of the Casatius yeah. coin, I want to back it up even further. Like, what city are you from in Texas? And just what was your upbringing like? Because I think that that also sort of in informs, you know, what industries we're interested in and how we look at money. So tell me a little bit about your background. Yeah. You want to go all the way back? Yeah. Okay. So all the way back, I grew up in Dallas. I grew up in a wealthy neighborhood in Dallas called Plano, uh, West Plano to be specific. Plano is a very large city. And uh, Dallas was a very kind of like flashy city, uh, very into money, very into just working hard. Um, Texans are kind of flashier in Dallas people. In, in Texas, Dallas people are kind of considered a little bit more bougie, if you will, especially from certain neighborhoods. So that was my upbringing. I went to a pretty uh, normal high school called Hebron. Uh, we actually won state when I was in high school. I was on the football team. Nice. So we won state in Texas, um, Division uh, 4A Division two, undefeated. So wow. that was pretty cool. So I played football in middle school, high school. That was what you did back then, especially back, you know, I graduated high school in 06. That was just kind of culturally what you did back then. Um, so I, I played linebacker and tight end. So I was a football player, kind of jockey type dude. Yeah. But at the same time, I took all AP classes. So uh, me and three other guys who were my friends who were on the football team and did the same thing. We called ourselves the jock nerds. So we were, <laughs> we were the jock nerds at school where we're both jocks. You must have been very popular time. with the girls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, yeah, we were, yeah, yeah, kind of popular and, uh, um, you know, nerdy at the same, same time. So that was a really fun experience. I think I had a very good, high, like very good upbringing in terms of high school experience. It was a very safe high school. We won state championship in football. You know, it's kind of your quintessential Texas sort of, sort of thing. And what did your parents do? My mom was a stay at home mom. And then my dad had his own, uh, his own CPA practice oh, with wow. a few other partners and they got bought by Larson Allen. Uh, one of like the, not the big, not that was it the big four or the, uh, I forget. Yeah. The big four there's, this is like the top eight. 
Wow. So to build out some of their Texas, um, the Texas branches, they bought his accounting firm. And then now he's a managing partner at Tolleson, which is a high net worth individual uh, multifamily office. So yeah, we, we kind of, you know, we, I grew up in it with a background of like understanding finance was talked about at the dinner table, yeah. taxes, that sort of thing. I mean, he's a tax CPA. So everything he thinks about is taxes. Um, granted he's a little bit more conservative. So, and they're conservative, um, parents in general. I mean, they're both very religious, um, and, you know, kind of more conservative with, with everything in that regard. I'm not saying this is a bad or good thing. It's just who they are. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Texas as a conservative place and I went to a conservative university, Texas A&M. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was through some, you know, open-minded experimentation that led me to expand my thought process and consciousness beyond certain sort of um, b- uh, boundaries that most Texans keep themselves trapped within. Yeah. Um, and that's what kind of like, you know, that combined with me also being libertarian, um, you know, in 2010, um, that's when I graduated college, you know, I had been in school for a couple of years during and right after the 2008 financial crisis studying finance. Right. You know, that just really rocked my fundamental trust and understanding of the, of the financial system. And it was that combined with this more experimental, like thinking outside the box. I mean, I was big into torrenting, uh, big in, you know, so like illegal file sharing, yeah, um, all that stuff, you know, kind of pushing the boundaries of what's legal. I was kind of constantly doing that. Yeah. You know, more of, more of what you'd expect from a college kid to push the boundaries of what's legal on that. Nothing too crazy. <laughs> here. Um, but that in Texas was a pretty liberal sort of mindset to have. And that, sure. that I think enabled me to look at Bitcoin. And when I saw it, I was like, this might make sense. Um, and you so studied Keynesian economics in school, right? There's no university. I don't think in America that teaches Austrian school of economics because Keynesian economics is what is supported by the federal reserve and the entire institutional system. So if you were to teach this, it would be hypocrisy. It would be, it would be not hypocrisy. It would be a, you know, you'd be like burned at the stake. The federal reserve funds research in economics departments to the tune of hundreds of millions a year. (laughs) So it's this, it's this cycle where, you know, if you want to get funding, you can't talk about Austrian economics. You'll also be ostracized and isolated from your fellow uh, researchers or professors Um, it'd be a very lonely existence and I don't want to get too dismal, but you know, whenever any new emerging technology comes out, being the first really sucks. Like you are widely perceived as either crazy or mean and and a terrible person because you're into this new thing. Um, it's actually a very lonely journey being first to something because you only you and very few other people see this future and everyone else thinks you're crazy or you're a terrible person. You know, for example, I go on dates in 2013 when I moved out to San Francisco and I'm like, oh man, it's San Francisco. Everyone's going to be talking about Bitcoin and cool tech stuff. And I go on these dates and I, you know, bring out Bitcoin to a girl and she'd go, so are you into like drugs and money laundering or something? You know, <laughs> like that, that was the wide, the, it wasn't her fault. You know, it was just like, that was the wide perception of what Bitcoin is sure. or what Bitcoin was at that time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, with my upbringing, it's actually kind of a, miracle. I'm, I'm this open-minded given my upbringing. I, I think it was the exposure to the internet and just being able to Google anything and research anything, constantly questioning things. That was our generation. Uh, yeah. But so how did you discover the Austrian um, school of economics? And is that what made you feel like when someone started talking to you about Bitcoin, you felt like, hey, this kind of solves some of the problems that I've seen? Yeah. So 2008 hits. I'm in college um, at Mays Business School at Texas A&M. And we've got those ticker tapes going around. The ticker tapes are the price prices of different indexes and stocks, sea of red, right? And then you go into class and the professor doesn't know shit yet. They're just reading up a textbook that was written by someone who doesn't know shit about economics either. And then you watch TV and it's some old dude, some old white dude, balding white dude who's talking about, oh, we've got it under control. And then, <laughs> and then you read on the internet, you're like, wait a second, they don't have any of this under control. Um, so it was, it started with that of questioning the nature of my reality. Um, for those who watch Westworld, you know, it's like, you start to question the nature of your reality and you realize a lot of this is just a belief system. We all just believe they have it under control and then they kind of have it under control if we all believe that they do. And, um, it was through that questioning sort of 
line of reasoning where I go, wait, well, what does work? And I'm like, you know, the gold standard was a really interesting thing to examine and look at. And that's where, you know, sound money or a gold standard was a very attractive um, alternative where it kept governments honest. It prevented this situation of bailouts that would have occurred. Um, and so my mind was already ready for a Bitcoin like gold 2.0 concept. Gold had a lot of flaws. It was what had worked before. And so when Bitcoin came around, I think what was really cool is one, the monetary policy, the 21 million, the fixed monetary policy was mind-blowingly innovative um, compared to a perpetual inflationary environment, right? Like just print, 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 print. Right. And with uh, the other part was the uh, censorship resistance. I think that was particularly cool, especially with Silk Road. I mean, Silk Road demonstrated beyond a reasonable doubt that this was something that was very hard to shut down. That decentralization, that resiliency that enabled the immutability, the ability to not be censored, all of that, I think, was very telling for me that this is something real. This is something that can solve a problem. And I was a very, very big libertarian type, you know, first of all, like liking the gold standard because it brought governments to made them more responsible, but also so more, you know, fiscally conservative, but socially liberal, mm -hmm. socially liberal aside, you know, obviously with experimenting with different things and challenging what's legal, you're like, wait a second, this doesn't make any sense. Why? Why is Adderall legal and something else isn't? You know, these are, you're selling amphetamine to kids. And then, you know, weed's illegal, right? So you go down this rabbit hole and you start to question each one. And then you're like, well, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Why do we trust the government with this? And so, uh, you know, the permissionless nature of being able to spin Bitcoin or whatever you like, I particularly enjoyed because it meant that there was no subjectivity of having a government weigh on an individual decision making, which inevitably led to these huge misallocations of capital into the, you know, government spending on defense budgets to DEA actions. You know, for example, like with the drug wars, I think that was a really big one that sort of like rocked my confidence in any sort of government intervention where, you know, prohibition doesn't work as we saw with alcohol and the drug war has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that governments are terrible at policing this sort of thing. So with Bitcoin having it be impossible to censor, I thought that was really cool. I was like, this is, this is awesome. You can do it for whatever you like, good or bad. And that, that sort of permissionless nature is the brilliance of what this is. Um, and then that monetary policy was a genius breakthrough too. And that's what a lot of early Bitcoiners didn't get. Almost, almost all early Bitcoiners didn't really, they were like, yeah, it's kind of like a gold, but like most didn't like, think that was like really mind, like mind blowing. I'm like, it's incredible because when you fix, <laughs> when you fix the, when you fix the supply, that means there's no possible way in the future to where you could increase it to where inflation could be added to it. Right. You can divide it as much as you want, but you don't, you won't be able to expand it and sure. just destroy it. Right. And that's, I think that's, what's really cool is like Bitcoin's monetary policy is actually easier to understand than every other government monetary policy ever. Um, 21 million. That's it. Anyone can get that. I think it's such a brilliant breakthrough and such an easy math thing for a normal person to think through is like, oh, I own one Bitcoin out of 21 million. Boom. Easy. Uh, versus like with the monetary policy, it's like, okay, so you've got the Fed, you've got the treasury, you've got investment banks. <laughs> yeah. And then there's this huge crazy thing that happens where they, you know, 5,000 people at the Federal Reserve talk about what to do for a month and then they figure out what to do. And then they awkwardly implement it through a bunch of crazy levers. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, I think um, not many yeah, early, early Bitcoin days, it was, there was almost no content, right? Like there was, there were no medium articles. There were no podcasts. There's no YouTube videos. Yeah, sure. There was some, but they were very technical. Like the first thing right. they do is they hop into like how a transaction works with encryption. And I'm like, and if you say the word nonce or public private key, you're going to lose your audience like that, <laughs> you know, like introduce them slowly to these topics. Um, and you know, we can talk about this later, but that's also why I got into creating my own content. Cause I felt like there was, I didn't feel that particularly like that. I was a good writer or a public speaker at all until two years ago. And then I was like, well, I, I feel like people are misrepresenting Bitcoin materially. So I'm going to go write about this because I think that this narrative should be corrected. Yeah. yeah. And then it turned out other people liked my writing and that's how I, I went down this rabbit hole. Yeah, no, I'm excited to hear about that in a little bit as well. But okay, let's let's talk about that moment in 2012 where I believe you were in Austin. You were working, I think, at an investment bank at, at the time and someone invited you out for drinks and you got handed these cassatious coins. Tell me about that whole experience. 
Yeah. So I, I was in Dallas, actually. I was in Dallas. Um, I worked at a small investment firm focused on commercial real, real estate. Nothing too glamorous. It wasn't, I, I wasn't smart enough to be an investment banker or work hard enough to be an investment banker back in the day. Um, so I was an analyst there. And my buddy Kevin paid me back for a beer with a Cassatius coin. He's like, hey, check this thing out. It's, a, it's called a Bitcoin. And uh, you peeled, peeled off the little, the little um, holographic strip and you were able to, to, to extract the private key from that. Wow. And of course, the first thing I do is I want to cash it out. Like I, that's the first thing I wanted to do. And how much was it worth then? I think it was around, so five to eight dollars. Oh my God. I know, I know. The first, the first thing though is most people, when you get that, you know, most of them, if you gift them Bitcoin, they probably sold it. That was kind of a very frustrating thing for early Bitcoiners <laughs> is gifting Bitcoin is a popular thing to do at Christmas or another holiday with the family members. You'd check back a couple of years later and they'd be like, oh, I sold it after it doubled. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, it's a very common story. Um, so the first thing I do when I get this Cassatius coin is I'm like, oh, I want to sell it. <laughs> and then he starts to tell me about Silk Road and... And then he's like, yeah, you can run, you know, you can run the code yourself, you know, for like the first wallet I had was Bitcoin core. So I had a full node as my first wallet. Um, so I had to wait till all the blocks synced. And it was, you know, private key management back then was tough too, because you, you didn't have a back, like you had to export the private key versus like, or print out the private key versus the 12 to 24 word backup that didn't come out until 2013, 2014. Mm, a lot wow. of people don't remember that. So like backing your coins up was tough. Wow. And, yeah. So I, you know, started to play around. I created a Mt. Gox account. Um, I had to use, uh, I used BitInstant to send some money to Mt. Gox. I used Dewalla. So yeah, like when you wired money to Mt. Gox, like when you sent money over there to go buy Bitcoin, it would take you like a week. Uh, BitInstant, Charlie Shrem's venture, it's called BitInstant because you could get it same day, but the fees were higher. It's like 10% fees or something. Um, but yeah, it was just like... <laughs> It was a really, really hard to buy Bitcoin and store it properly. I mean, most of those, most of those folks either sold Bitcoin, got it lot, like stuck in Mount Gox, or uh, forgot their password. You know, it's, oh, gosh. it's those uh, stories just make me so sad. I feel so bad for those people. <laughs> but wait, so yeah. did you start buying up a lot of coins at that point because they were super cheap? Yeah, I mean, great question. So, you know, we all wish we had a time machine to go back and sell everything we had, including as Pierre puts it, sell our chairs and buy all the Bitcoin we can. Um, the, <laughs> the thing is, let's see, back, what, what, what year is that? So it's 2012. Um, you know, I was like in my early 20s uh, and had a job in Dallas where I was making 45K a year, uh, which was a good job in Dallas at that time. Um, you know, this is Texas. Like Texas, you can live pretty well off 45K. But yes. it's not a whole lot of money after taxes, after expenses and car payment and rent. Um, you know, so I didn't put that much money money into Bitcoin like early on. A lot of people think I've got like a, a hundred thousand coins stashed away somewhere. I'm like, if I had a hundred thousand coins, I'd be on my yacht right now. I won't be talking <laughs> to any of y'all. Um, so you know, I, I bought a good amount. I bought, you know, I'm proud of what I bought given my what I had into disposable income. Um, compared to a lot of my friends who I talked to about it and they didn't buy any. Right. Um, and then you also have friends who bought it. They bought a lot. Like I have a friend who bought, who had a thousand Bitcoins in 2013. Thousand, right? Like a thousand is a nice number. I mean, that's oh my a substantial stack. I would give so anything cool. to have had someone tell me about Bitcoin back then. <laughs> yeah, because people like my average cop, cost basis was around a hundred ish. Wow. And so, you know, a hundred Bitcoin at a hundred dollars is still 10,000 bucks. That's yeah. a lot to put into like a magic internet money when you're in your, For early, sure. you know, so I think people, that's a better way to frame it. A lot of people think, oh, you got in at like a dollar, hundred dollars is my average cost basis. So that, you know, that, that makes it a bit more expensive. Um, so I had a buddy who had a thousand coins and we're still friends. Um, so 2013, it goes up to a thousand dollars. He doesn't sell. So he waits all the way through 2017 until it comes back and then he sells all of it. Every <gasps> single one. He didn't see, he didn't keep one. Why? Because he hit the million dollar mark. Uh, a lot of people who didn't, if you didn't fully believe in Bitcoin, you hit a certain threshold of wealth and you sold it all. Wow. Or you traded it for an altcoin. You had to really believe in Bitcoin to hodl this long. You had to really, really believe in it. Um, and he just didn't fully believe in it. And um yeah, I mean, I saw a lot of these though. A lot of people sold all their coin when they hit 
X amount. A lot of it's when people hit a million dollars, they go, wow. oh, I'm a millionaire. I'm going to cash out. And a lot of these people are young. So they go, oh, I got a million bucks. I can retire. And you're like, well, actually a million dollars doesn't get you very far. And so that's a very common thing that occurred. You know, these are young men who are kind of, you know, they're not very rational and they're, they're making, you know, they bet on this magic internet money. And a lot of them took their money out sure. when it went up 10 X or 20 X and they made a million bucks. And you um, hodled. Yeah, exactly. That's why the hodl mantra is so, so um, critical is it's that reinforcement to believe in Bitcoin and even more broadly hodl represents just commitment. Like if you invest in any stock, you should at least want to hold it for five to 10 years. This is good investment this is classic invest investment advice that like Warren Buffett gives out. Same with like relationships or friends. You shouldn't hang out with people you don't like, you know, <laughs> you only got one life to live. Think about who you're hanging out with and huddle the ones close to you. You know, so it's, it's huddle is more that. like a, a mindset. I think, you know, it's, I, I chose Bitcoin because I learned everything about it and I really thought it could change the world. And, and that's why I put my capital into it and huddled. Um, and, and same with any investment that I have in the future. Um, whether it be other equities or anything else. So take me from when you first discovered Bitcoin to eventually moving to San Francisco and starting to work in Silicon Valley. Tell me about that experience and what were you doing? Yeah, so I'll stray off the the uh, more boring typical narrative I give and give it a little bit more color. So um, San Francisco, the small investment firm I worked at in Dallas, they were like, hey, we're opening up our West Coast portfolio. Do you want to come out and, and help us oversee this? Because they had no one on the West Coast. They needed boots on the ground. And I was the only young single dude at the firm. So they were like, you want to go do it? And I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. Um, and it's so weird to look back at all of this and to where I am now and all of the random variations that led me down to this moment. You know, like it's, it's, it's sometimes it's scary and mind blowing at the same time of like one little misstep in a different direction. I might have even missed Bitcoin, right? Like right. all of these sort of random variations, it's, it's mind blowing sometimes to think about it. Um, so I come up to come out to San Francisco and I'm like, I'm still into this Bitcoin thing. And I'm like, oh man, this is like tech, Silicon Valley. There's got to be other Bitcoiners around here. So I go to the San Francisco Bitcoin meetup at 20 Mission. And um, it was owned by Jared Kenna. Jared Kenna was an early, early Bitcoiner. He like mined Bitcoin on his laptop in Afghanistan when he was in the military. Um, he's a character. He's actually still a good friend of mine. He lives down in Colombia. And uh, he created Trade Hill, the first US exchange before Kraken, before Coinbase. Being early is the same as being wrong, though, in tech. So he was just too early. It didn't work out. Um, he owned 20 Mission, which was like a, a hacker house with like a living space in it. So there's like 20 apartments. And then below there were offices. And that's where he'd host the Bitcoin meetup. Wow. It's a pretty fucking grungy building. I mean, this is like a... I wouldn't... I would never stay there. <laughs> um, I, it's very grungy. It's in the Mission. Very yeah. dirty. Um, okay. And downstairs, they had a cooler of PBRs, and that's where they hosted the meetup. And you can actually go back on meetup, by the way, the, the meetup.com. Yeah. You can go look at the meetup, and if you scroll all the way back to the original ones, you can see who all RSVP'd to some of them. Oh, wow. And and like some of the original Coinbase people are there, right? Like, I mean, you met a lot of big people. Yeah. I mean, you know, it was Brian and Fred from Coinbase, uh, Jesse from Kraken, Charlie Lee from Litecoin, uh, Jed McCaleb from Ripple Stellar. Um, I'm like the only non-billionaire in the group. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I guess I should have done a little bit better. Um, sorry, mom. Sorry, dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, you know, and I was, I, I didn't know anything about tech. Like I'm showing up in fucking business casual. <laughs> I look like an idiot. Like this is tech, right? I, I, I would get right off work. I rushed over so I could go to the meetup. So I had to wear my business casual. So I'm like the only guy wearing business casual in the mission, like anywhere in the mission. No one wears That's business casual hilarious, in the mission. Yeah. Or San Francisco. Yeah. Um, and I'm like the most preppy dude in there and one of the least technical folks. Uh, but I was just thrilled to be there, be a part of it and, and to talk to folks. March 2013 hits, price goes from $10 to 260. Boom. That's when the rush comes. You had VCs literally slinging out business cards, like literally going out, like handing out business cards to everyone. Um, it was, it was Lightspeed Ventures was, uh, oh, what's his name? It was one of the partners at Lightspeed Ventures who was doing that. And, um, you know, there's 150 people in there. There's like, everyone's excited. It, back in that day, everyone was building something too. 
Um, and I think that's what got me kind of interested is everyone was tinkering and everyone had their own project, even if it was like a project, 99% failed. Um, and most were pretty silly. Uh, but you know, in that moment, I'm like, maybe I should go build something too. And during the 2013 price run up from $10 to 260, I constantly was trying to check the price of Bitcoin on my phone, but there was no app in the app store that had real time pricing. The developers had been lazy and just did every 15 minutes they would update the price. So I was like, I don't know anything about how to build an app, but I know Photoshop, which means I can design it and I'll go analyze every other finance app and start to sketch and sketch out what the app should look like in terms of usability. Wow. And, and, and you I, did this uh, on your spare in, time? Yeah. Yeah. So I was working like 12 hour days and then doing that on the side. Um, it was a pretty awful, awful first year in terms of like the amount of work that I did. And I was, but I was just obsessed with this idea to solve this problem um, and to solve it in a really elegant way. And so I built a product called Zero Block. Zero Block was the most popular mobile app in 2013. Ask anybody from that era and they're like, oh dude, Zero Block, I was opening that all the time. Oh my gosh. And um, it was fun because it was just, I built a product to solve my own problem. Turns out a lot of other people had that problem too. Then I had to figure out how to enable people to find the product distribution marketing. And so that's where I learned a growth hack of how to rank number two for the keyword Bitcoin in the app store. So when you searched Bitcoin, we were number two. Wow. And that's what drove a huge portion of installs. And then word of mouth carried it from there. Um, at the May 2013 San Jose conference was the first time that the app had been completed. So like the beta had been completed and it was available in the app store. I cold pitched people at the conference. I walked around and met people and cold pitched them on downloading my app. Wow. So yeah, I was just obsessed with like, I've always been like, I've always loved tech. I just was in finance and didn't have any sort of guidance or, or anyone sure. telling me how to get into tech. I didn't know anyone in tech. Came out here, didn't know. I only knew one person, my roommate. And um, and just, you know, through an obsession to solve a problem, figured out what good product principles are. That's ultimately what it takes to build good products is you have to be obsessed with solving a problem. Turned out if you obsessively solve it for yourself and a lot of other people have your same problem, it's going to be a popular product. Um, and so that was, I think my, as I phrase it, normally I stumbled and bumbled my way into tech. And I think that, I think this is the longer form version of that. That's so fascinating. Wow. So you essentially became a developer with no background in it. I mean, you obviously built a good team around you, but you, you built an app. I mean, I, I think about sometimes app ideas that I have and I'm like, oh, that's probably impossible. I have no clue what I would be doing. I did everything other than code. So uh, design, marketing, um, everything else. But uh, I actually did do a little, little bit of coding on the HTML. But um, So what happened yeah, I, next? What was your next gig after that? Because you essentially, you sold that, right? Yeah, we sold it to blockchain.com. So I was the first hire after Nick Carey, the original CEO of blockchain.com. So blockchain.com was uh, created by Ben Reeves, not by Peter, not by Peter Smith, not by Nick Carey. They, they weren't the co-founders. They were... It came on after Roger basically bought most of the company and then brought those two on. Um, but it was Nick Carey, then myself, then we hired out the engineering team. I didn't know what the hell I was doing back then. Neither did Nick. <laughs> we uh, Let's put it this way. Their stakey reputation on Bitcoin in 2013 required a lot of faith and you also probably weren't high caliber. I mean, I was a B player. I, again, I'm new to tech. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing here uh, compared to someone who's got 10 years of Google, right? Or, or 10 years of Google, five years of Facebook. That's the whole space though. It was all kind of B players. We didn't know what the hell we were doing, but we were the only ones who showed up for the football game. We were the only ones who were going to go play. And so, um, you know, there was a lot of like these early crypto startups, a lot of struggles with just survival. Uh, Blockchain.com was in, in an okay spot, but, you know, for example, like Kraken had to raise an emergency round. I think, you know, Jesse's talked about that publicly. And Jesse put a lot of his own Bitcoin into Kraken to keep it afloat. A lot of early OG Bitcoiners, if you didn't lose it, if you didn't sell out when you made a million, a lot of them plowed it into their own companies during the 2014, 2015 bear market. And they burned through thousands of coins or hundreds of coins trying to pay salaries across the board. Wow. Um, yeah, it was... Uh, the, the 2015 winter was particularly brutal. So worked at blockchain.com, was the first product manager there, stumbling into my way into tech. And then I stumble over to Change Tip and start to learn a little bit more around what a good product looks like. Uh, 
left there, went to go work at uh, Uber. So Uber had kind of a lucky break where I knew something called app store optimization, which was how to rank your app highly in the app store. Cause I had figured out some exploits in terms of how to do that. Wow. And um, from that experience that I had at like blockchain.com doing that zero block. And also I was doing consulting on the side. I had a job alert out for app store optimization. Uber had a rollout for app store optimization. I cold applied. Um, also did some kind of more growthy hacks where I emailed, I found, so I lo- looked on LinkedIn and I looked at who my hiring manager might be. And then I did an email checker where the email checker checks the variations of the email to see if it's a valid email. Like, is it, is it uh, Pete dot Ross or is it, you know, Pete Ross or Pete R. Mm-hmm. So figured out the right combination. And then I cold emailed him after I applied. Nice. I was like, hey, by the way, I think I'm a great fit for the role. Would love to interview. So um, nice. got in there, um, was placed very randomly on it on probably the most pedigreed team at Uber, which was really, really, again, these, ver- these random variations in my life were just so crazy to think back at them, like think back and how random they were. Well, can I ask um, you real quick? I mean, if you're like deep in the crypto space at this point, and you're obviously a really big believer in Bitcoin, why would you go to essentially a digital cab company? <laughs> Great question. In 2015, 2016, there was maybe one product manager job in all of crypto open. These country, these companies were starving and they weren't sure how long the winter was going to last. So they cut spend almost to the, to the bone. Um, everything was cut. Everything at crypto companies in these winters get cut to the bone. It's really, really hard to survive. So if I wanted to develop and really grow, there just wasn't anywhere to grow. Everything was stagnating and dead. And so I'm like, I love Bitcoin, but I need to go work on my professional career. And that's where Uber was the hottest tech company back in 2016. I mean, in Silicon Valley, that was like the new hottest place to go. So I was like, this is incredible. I applied, I got in and Uber was like, at that time, Uber was considered like, like they're conquering the world sort of thing. And I randomly get put on one of the coolest teams at the company, Rider Growth. Rider Growth focuses on uh, growth of the user base. Um, And Rider Growth specifically was onboarding engagement and virality. So that was you acquire the customer, uh, get them through the signup flow, and then engage them in the product long term and encourage them to share the product with their friends. I spearheaded App Store Optimization, which was right on top, right before they sign up. Um, Because the entire experience is via the app. So we sense the whole world you know, was sending traffic to the app stores, right? So I optimized all of Uber's app and Play Store pages for Uber, Uber Driver, and Uber Eats in every country in the world. Wow. Um, so I randomly got put on this, but that role though should have been on another team. And eventually I moved my role over to another team. So interesting. But the team I got put on was really cool because um, writer growth was like very close to the executive branch, like the executive level of the company. So my second week I pitched, I, <laughs> I had 20 slides to present to Travis Kalanick, my second week at Uber, which wow. I thought I was going to fucking die. I thought, <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to have a heart attack. You know, I, <laughs> I was a little startup guy. I knew nothing about big tech culture. I just joined this company. Luckily I breezed through it and I didn't get, didn't, didn't get fired. It, it went smoothly. Oh, um, but also during this meeting, I remember this meeting really <laughs> in particular. So we, we had crazy prep for it. Uber was really, really in this, this goes, this will feed into later in the story of how I started writing, mm-hmm. but Uber required that you had to write TLDRs on every single email and on decks, you had to really compress your narrative as succinctly as possible. What's a TLDR? Too long. Didn't read. I ain't got time to read your whole paragraph. I don't want to read your five page report. Tell me what the hell matters right, right away. Okay. Executives in particular, you have to compress your narrative really, really tightly for them because their schedule is really, really, um, yeah. really, really compressed. So, um, you know, I join the deck review process was incredibly intense for this prep with, uh, with, um, Travis. So first we do a first draft, then we do two more drafts. Then we have the data scientists come in and reskin our data in ways that they think Travis likes. So like, will Travis like this type of chart? So they reskin the chart uh, and then they bring in designers to reformat the deck in a way that's like very cohesive and clear and clean. And then we do a couple more rounds of feedback with 
senior executives one level below Travis to make sure because they know how what Travis likes. Jeez, this seems like so much play. work for one. Per, it's almost like for his preference. It was the quarterly report for the team and what we were doing and what we needed. So it had to be really compressed and, and to get this level of access was super cool. So, you know, and our deck prep was with the head of growth. Um, oh, what's his name? He, um, he was the former head of international growth for Facebook. So a lot of ex Facebook growth people who built out the idea of a growth team sure. are now growth people at Uber. So Uber's growth team was like the super elite of growth people. So I stumbled upon the luckiest roll of dice ever. I mean, Again, I, it's part skill, but also luck. This was a perfect example of that. Like the opportunity came by and I, I latched onto it really quick, um, but it was certainly an incredible opportunity. Um, so I had a great time at Uber. Just it was, it was a wonderful place to grow, develop, see what A players look like. Um, but one thing I picked up was narrative compression. So how do you explain things simply? You know, we got, you know, with, with marketing and product related metrics, you got a bunch of things going on. You know, let's say you're looking at uh, a metric of writer usage in Dallas went up or down for the month. What does that mean? Why did that happen? Like sussing out which, uh, w- what impacted that metric and then crafting a story around it and doing that in a very succinct manner is really tough to do. Like a lot of people in, in schools are terrible at teaching kids how to do narrative compression. They ask them to write five pages around a topic and it should be no, use the least number of words to describe what happened in the book because <laughs> ain't nobody got time for that. And ain't nobody want to read through a five page report. Just give it to me straight. Give it to me quick. And um, Uber was exceptional at that. Uber, basically the, the whole company was about hustling and moving quickly and being really efficient. So that, that fit, fit my vibe very well. Oh, one last point about Uber. Uber was breaking the law in every single city it was in. Oh yeah. I yeah. They that. were banned, right there. They weren't allowed. Yeah. I love that about Uber. Uber was like, we don't give a shit if these are like laws or not. And I loved that vibe. It's a very libertarian vibe. Um, Uber's culture is distinctly different than many other tech companies. Uh, Uber was very much like, we're going to break the rules because we don't give a shit. Yeah. <laughs> and I, well, I just love that vibe as like a Bitcoin or same sort of thing. It's like, it's a permissionless, uh, you know, Bitcoin's permissionless. I'm going to move Bitcoin to anyone else I want and store it, whether or not you like it. And Uber was like, people deserve the right to move around their city more efficiently and taxis are basically a scam. So we're going to go break the rules because these rules aren't ethical. Yeah, well, we'll get to a little bit more of your philosophy in a second. But just out of curiosity, since we brought that up and the talk of bans, um, you know, some people don't want to invest in Bitcoin simply because of that reason. That One of their worries is that it could be banned in the U.S. Do you have any thoughts on that? This is probably the most common question that I hear. And uh, I forget who said it, but you can't kill an idea whose time has come. And with Bitcoin, I think that's very true is that the only way to kill Bitcoin, because we can each run a full node, we can each choose to buy and store value in Bitcoin. And there are so many different places you can do that across the world in terms of buying and selling Bitcoin. Uh, you can you can run a full node very easily on your home computer. You know, These are mechanisms to where the faith and belief in Bitcoin can only be killed if you destroy that faith, the, the belief in it. Um, if you're somehow able to do that, you could destroy Bitcoin. Now, when it comes to governments, can they destroy Bitcoin? I find it very improbable that they could destroy this belief in Bitcoin in every mind across the world, especially since most of these minds don't trust their government. <laughs> yeah. So it makes it very unlikely they would be able to develop a, a, a narrative or convince them otherwise. Now, on a more tactical basis, how could governments try to kill Bitcoin or can they? When we look at history and we look at um, different things that have occurred, like uh, the pro- like prohibition. Prohibition has epically failed, um, and same with the drug. You know, old prohibition with alcohol and the drug wars have epically failed, which demonstrate that governments can't ban things uh, very effectively. We've also got the gold ban in uh, Order sixty one hundred two, and gold wasn't. Not many people turned in their gold. Most people disregarded the law as ridiculous. Also, the U.S. was one of very few countries that did that. That wasn't a globally done thing, and that leads me to one of my other points all the governments in the world rarely act together to solve something. China, Russia, can you imagine if China, Russia, and the US come together on something? I mean, I find that very improbable. (laughs) And these are all superpowers, right? They have huge economies. They have um, big militaries. Um, There's just no way that, there's just no way that you have these countries that are enemies that they would band together to solve this problem of Bitcoin, especially given the game theory 
of one having an advantageous um, financial position that it would be in if it were to defect first. So if there was this coalition that was created, it's almost inevitable that one of them would break away and be like, actually, yo, we bought Bitcoin, peace. And then that yeah. would that would un- that would make everything fray away as well. Right. Um, so you know, countries can't ban things very easily. Countries ban- coming together all to ban Bitcoin is very unlikely. Um, yeah, I just think that those are, are kind of like your your key reasons. Also, you've got um, market penetration. So as Bitcoin is more and more uh, widely owned and, and appreciated in the markets, it becomes very unlikely that countries would ban it. For example, in the United States, it's estimated around 10% of Americans own Bitcoin. But what happens when that reaches 30% or 40%? What happens right. when not only Tesla owns it, but all of the S&P 500? I mean, if you were to ban Bitcoin, the stock market's going to tank. Right. Most citizens are going to be in wide revolt. You're not going to get reelected. It makes it basically impossible. Um, so that those are the reasons why I think it's very unlikely Bitcoin could be banned by a government. I think the adoption one is probably the most compelling defensive mechanism that Bitcoin has. That's why I feel so strongly to get the message of Bitcoin out there and people hodling it is for their own financial um, well-being, but also the more we have in this collective unity against the, the excess of these governments, the better off chance we have fighting it. You know, if we're a small group of a thousand people, we're pretty easy to stamp out. Yeah. But when we're 30% of the population, good luck. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's why I find it so interesting what you're doing and what like the Peter McCormick's and a lot of the evangelists. Now you guys are all, you're highly followed on Twitter um, and you're really, you've become sort of faces of this technology. So I guess we'll talk a little bit about, you know, how you got to that point. So you left Uber. Um, Tell me about your journey to, you know, not only growth lead at Kraken, but now you, you have this newsletter, you talk to people from a general background, but also investors at top levels. So talk to me about that sort of evolution to where we are today with you. Yeah. So um, after leaving Uber, I co-founded a company called Interchange. So Interchange did my, uh, Interchange was about uh, solving portfolio reconciliation issues that crypto hedge funds were having. Those were kind of like the hot new thing in crypto in 2017. Crypto hedge funds, a lot of money was being made there. They were spending a lot of different, to- a lot of different tools. So we had a company called Picks and Shovels. And we created our first product, Interchange, to do basically accounting for crypto hedge funds. And we were, I'd say, like an um, okay success. We were kind of struggling along, doing doing all right, not knocking it out of the park. I mean, crypto winters, again, are, are very hard. Mm-hmm. Um, so in 2019, uh, we felt that there was a really good fit with Kraken, and Kraken was looking to build out some of the reporting infrastructure. And I've known Jesse for a long time. So we got acquired by Kraken. Um now, I had been a growth guy, so growth, I mean, more like product and marketing back in, um, you know, when I first got to Silicon Valley all the way through Uber. At Interchange, we had no need for that. So I was a business development manager. So I'd go and uh, help with raising money, help with um, acquiring customers. And when we got acquired, I just moved naturally into that role over at Kraken. So I was on the BD team initially. Um, but being a growth guy, we're always itching to go tinker with things, go, go push the limits, go make things grow, go make something happen. And, and BD is a much slower function. Um, it takes a lot of time to develop these relationships, sometimes years. Um, and versus like you go push out a new ad or a new landing page and the impact is immediate. So there's a tight feedback loop and you're feeling like you're moving the ball forward. So um, I cold pitched the idea of a growth team to Jesse and Jeremy and they loved it. So I um, built it up. I scoped it out and, and built it from scratch at Kraken, um, which was really, really fun. And we're under the product org under Jeremy Welch, who's the uh, new uh, head of product as of about eight months ago. And we built out this team. Um, really, really proud of what we've done so far. We've basically gone from zero to one in an incredibly fast duration, uh, the team's going to triple by the end of the year, which is pretty wild. And at the same time, I was the interim uh, director of product marketing too, a separate marketing team. So I was leading both teams and we luckily got a good, a really sharp guy in Dara to take over that role. Um, so yeah, built up and led both of those teams. When these teams are created early on, there's a lot of, uh, this is like a when people go work at, at companies, they, they, most people never see this side of how companies are created. They go work in their individual role 
and they have a manager. And that's about, that's almost everyone. And then some people become managers, but they become managers at very established tech companies. When tech companies or, or they're established at an established company, like these older companies, you know, they're very rigid in structure. Those structures have been there for forever. In high growth companies, structures are always moving. Right. And there's a, there's a huge component of like stakeholder management. Like, did I have the right relationships over on product to make this happen? Does I understand enough about product marketing and growth marketing? Which is weird because most people are, are in a specific discipline of understanding just growth marketing or just product marketing. I fortunately had done both and I knew a little bit about product. So I could kind of fit in between all of these. Um, and then also there's an educational component. And while it seems a, at first you're like, you know, most people step into a company where everyone knows what that team does, but until they do, you have to constantly reinforce what your team does and why it's important or how it intersects with their function. So there's a huge educational component and also definition of your territory. So mm -hmm. like, Hey, is this part of your team or is that part of this other person's team? And so, you know, that, that's a lot of like really tricky navigation that almost no one, no one gets it. You sort of have to just step into that, that process and just really you know, communicate very effectively with your different stakeholders. So yeah, I built up the growth marketing and product marketing function at, at Kraken, which has been a blast. Um, now I'm just leading growth, which is awesome, uh, tripling the team size. So that's been a super fun journey. Um, you know, we're knocking out of the park with some of our metrics, like, um, some of them are just <laughs> crypto companies are so fucking crazy. I mean, like Uber didn't triple in size overnight or something, or like 10 X in size week over week. But, you know, Kraken, and we've talked about this publicly, we've had weeks where our signups 10 X over the last week. I mean, that's just crazy. That doesn't happen in tech. Like it may be, okay. Maybe clubhouse or something like yeah. the, 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 the darling new social product might, but for a financial product, that it's pretty rare that that happens. So, you know, when we think infrastructure and building product and on the growth side, how do you scale and build out the company that can be, <laughs> that can, that can handle this sort of intensity? I mean, this is, you know, you get more support tickets, you have more people coming to your website, you have all sorts of other things that you have to consider in growth. While we only focus on user acquisition, so acquiring new cracking customers, you know, <laughs> there's actually a moment too, when you know, we were acquiring so many customers due to some of our efforts, you know, there were Kraken had a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of downtime, you know, so it was funny because our team did our job so well that, you know, things ended up like we were having so many people come to the website that, you know, we couldn't handle certain amounts of traffic. Um, Coinbase as well struggles with this. You know, this isn't a uh, single Kraken thing. It's, it's kind of unanimous across the board with all crypto exchanges, especially ones that cater towards retail, because if you cater towards retail traders, you know, this is individuals going to your website versus like institutions. Well, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I just want to say it's what impresses me about what you've done is even when you haven't necessarily had the background or a certain position on your resume, you've been able to take on these different roles in this technology ecosystem. And I think that's inspiring because a lot of people in general, I think we limit ourselves, right? We're like, oh, well, I don't have a degree in that, or I don't have a, I don't have a background in that, so I can't even apply for that role. And you're kind of one of those people that's an example that you can learn anything. If you are interested in something and you're passionate about something and you believe in the product or the company or whatever it might be, you can learn it. And there's there might be a learning curve that's you know steep in some areas versus others, but you should go for it. And you now you can say you've done so many different aspects of the industry. And now look, you're speaking about it, right? It's a dangerous game to play though, because normally what people want to see on a resume, you got one year as a junior person, two years is like a next level, three years, the next level, four years in the next level. And so when you go apply to that awesome, really lucrative gig at Facebook, Google, they're like, great. Your resume shows me seven years experience in product, seven years experience in marketing, Boom. I know exactly how to fit you for this role. Here's a great compensation. And you've got two years in each. That doesn't help you out too much for what I kind of randomly fit into is perfect. But for the, um, for normal career trajectory, that could be deadly. Like if I didn't end up in a more leadership function, I would have been relegated to like, uh, rele relegated to roles that would not be appropriate for my age or experience. Mm -hmm. So it can be really dangerous if you don't hit that, 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 that velocity, you know, and hit that level, the next level, you could be in a bad spot. Now, certainly hundred percent agree with you saying, go give it a shot. 
the dirty little secret of everyone who's ever done anything is they didn't know what the hell they were doing in the beginning. No one yeah. did. Yeah. I mean, I mean, if you're going to go build the first rocket ship or go build the first something, obviously no one else came before them. So, you know, everyone's kind of making it up as they go anyways. Um, you know, use data, make intelligent, uh, think through things intelligently, seek feedback. And that that's like a huge portion of it, right? Is just being an empathetic stakeholder within this org. And then just thinking really sharply about how to go solve problems. Um, and then also like unblocking things when things get, when things get in your way, figuring out any way possible to get around it. For example, at Kraken, we're growing so fast that the recruiters told me, I can't put your job descriptions up for your jobs that you need to hire for because we can't handle it because we have so many people that we're hiring for. So I said, no, I, I don't think I'm, I'm not, I'm not okay with that. So what I told them is I'm like, my team will handle their own recruiting. So I turned all of my growth marketers into part-time recruiters and had them tasked per role. Wow. So we're all quasi, where they're doing their job plus doing this at the same time, because I don't want to wait three weeks until they're ready and I need to get these people hired. So I was like, cool, I'll be the recruiter for it. So I'm, <laughs> if you're, if you're applying to two of the roles, you'll, you'll get me who emails you for your first interview. <laughs> um, so yeah, that sort of mindset, that hustle, that just like, like never take no to just get it done. If you have that key mindset, you're going to do great. Um, and then there's also like the surface area of network, right? Like I met a ton of people in Silicon Valley spending eight years out here. And those increase the number of potential variable outcomes where next time someone thinks of a role that's open, they're like, oh, I know Dan, he does this because I met him at a dinner party. Um, you know, that, that increased surface area really helps for the kind of variance in your outcome of where you could go end up versus if you just cold apply to places, you can get a job that way. It's just a little bit harder. Well, so how did you become such a voice in this space? I mean, you have so many followers now on Twitter and you're a speaker. How did you build that? Yeah. So it actually started cause I got triggered. <laughs> that's the, uh, that's my, that's my hook here. So Naval Ravikant who we all really like on Twitter. Um, Love Naval. He used to follow me for a while too. Um, Naval's a great thought leader and we all really respect him on his thoughts across a wide variety of topics. In 2017, he called Bitcoin hodlers free riders. Yeah, that they weren't contributing to the protocol at all, that they were just free riding on it. Wow. And that triggered me at a level where I go, wait a second, this, is, this narrative is completely false and just really off base. And that was my first article. One well, of my first article that I wrote was uh, hodlers are the revolutionaries that the Bitcoin hodlers are the entire reason why Bitcoin exists without Bitcoin having a price. None of us would be here. If it was worth zero, who cares how clean the code is and how many engineers work on it if no one values it. And the hodlers are the ones who bought into it, who gave it life. And by hodling, they increase the awareness of Bitcoin because as the price goes higher, more people become aware of it and then buy it. As they hodl, that means that the block reward becomes larger, which makes mining more and more profitable, which makes more miners come into this space, which also brings more security to Bitcoin. Uh, and then as the price goes higher, more companies are created to build products and services for folks to want to use Bitcoin. So the holders are a part of this, this virtuous loop. Um, and he kind of completely missed the picture there. So that was my first article. And then back in 2018, um, yeah, 2018 is when I started to write. So only two years ago, two, three years ago. And um, another big narrative at the time was that, and the Ethereum community kept propagating this, which I found particularly annoying, that Bitcoin's energy consumption was a bad, unethical thing, that Bitcoin's boiling in the oceans. That narrative started from the Ethereum community. It was used by Vitalik to undermine confidence and network effects in Bitcoin so he could promote proof of stake as the alternative. Look at my proof of stake. It's much cleaner, much healthier. And so I found that particularly annoying as well. So that's where I wrote Proof of Work is Efficient, which is my most popular article. And that's where I debunk a lot of these common misunderstandings around how Bitcoin is wasting or using too much energy. Uh, Bitcoin isn't using too much energy. It does something very use useful for the world. And especially when we compare it to the legacy financial system, it uses a whole lot less energy. So um, these, were, these were common and there's a bunch more, right? I, I, I kept writing and these articles debunk common I think misaligned narratives at the time. So then me being a growth guy, I'm like, all right, well, what do I do now? And I had, you know, a couple, I think I had like 4,000 Twitter followers or something at the time. And I started to look at, okay, well, what makes a popular tweet? Like what makes a tweet sticky? 
And so I analyzed that, figured out the formatting that does that. And then I haven't missed a day of tweeting for two and a half years. Wow. Ever. So. Well, so like what kinds of things? Like things that are short, things that are memes, things that are. Yeah, it's the content itself. It's the formatting of the content and the content. So it's the formatting and the content and the consistency. The consistency is the part that most people don't grok. Wow. Um, here's how, so, and this, this is how growth people think. So how does Twitter, Twitter's algorithm work? It's a dummy algorithm. There's not a lot of manual human intervention. So how do you determine what tweets are popular? Well, uh, I see a tweet that has a high level of engagement. So Twitter surfaces the tweet in front of someone, they click on it, they like it, they op open up like the details, et cetera. Um, that indicates interest. So Twitter, as something gains, uh, you know, as something is being surfaced to more and more people, they see folks engaging with it. They're like, oh, wow. Okay. People like this. I'm going to surface it to more people. And that's how the content propagates is it looks at engagement rate and uses that as a function of attractiveness or relevancy that people think, find it relevant content that they like to engage with. Now, what happens on a daily basis is let's say, uh, let's say Natalie follows me on Twitter and Natalie is a, let's say she doesn't tweet and she's just a consumer of tweet content, which is actually a majority of people. A majority of people just consume rather than produce content. So Twitter goes, well, what do I show Natalie when she opens up the app for the first time? It's probably going to be uh, from someone that she's engaged with a lot in the past. So if she sees if she's engaged with Dan Held tweets a lot previously, Twitter's like, well, if I want her to stick around the app, uh, which makes Twitter more money because they can surface more ads. If I want Natalie to stick around the app, I'm first going to hit her with a piece of Dan Held content. Boom. Ooh. But then she also engages a lot with Peter McCormick. So that'll be the second tweet that she sees. <laughs> and then all of a sudden Natalie's hooked in the products. She's scrolling through and she's seen a bunch of tweets that are very compelling to her because Twitter understands her previous preferences. Now, what happens if I walk away? If I walk away and go on vacation for a week, Natalie opens up her app. There's no Dan Held tweet. So it surfaces another tweet to give her, to entertain her. When that happens, <laughs> you start to build a habit with that other piece of content. And now so when I come back and try to re-engage my audience, you've already started to re you've already started to engage with other content creators. That's so interesting. Yeah. Consistency is a key element of this to where it's, it's a very, very critical element. Um, the consistency, by the way, this goes across LinkedIn and YouTube as well. You have to be consistent with the content. You're, it's the Dan Held show. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm propagating that on, on different social channels and through my newsletter on a consistent basis. Um, the content though, too, with Twitter, if you go into the advanced search feature, and by the way, I love all, Bit all Bitcoiners should try to do this. Bitcoiners should propagate more Bitcoin content more widely. So any Bitcoiner that asks, I've always been open about my techniques and how I do it. Uh, it's not rocket science. It's kind of like a magic trick. When you don't see how it works, you're like, wow, Dan has 160,000 followers. But then once you know how it works, there's a little bit of the mystique is gone. But wow. how I got started, so I'll give some of the basic tips. Um, I On Twitter's advanced search, you can search for tweets that reference the word Bitcoin from someone or from anyone that reference the word Bitcoin or another phrase that have over a certain number of likes within a time window. So it's a very specific query that you can run. So I looked at the most popular tweets about Bitcoin, analyzed how they were constructed. And then I'm like, well, what if I take it and create a different variant of it with my own voice and my own narrative? Wow. And that's what, yeah. So that's how I analyzed and created my content in the beginning. Um, it's much different now, but that's the basis of it, um, which was, uh, you know, that's what a lot of growth people do. You're like, well, what's working? I'll just take that and take a variation of that. Um, now, granted, I've got a lot of my long form content. So my long form content is great. That's what I pride myself in. I have a lot of pumpy tweets. I think people should read my longer form stuff. That's what I'm proud of. Um, but the, these shorter tweets can hook people and get them to go read my longer form content. So I decided to build out this process where um, I figured out a way to hook people when they were scrolling through their Twitter feed. So in addition to my regular content, there's something called Twitter cards. Twitter cards are a way to have, you can have an auto playing video with text. And then when they click on the video, it opens up a web page. Mm -hmm. So I had really cool uh, MP4 videos that I found that were very like, you know, one looks like a blockchain, right? With like data flowing through it, or one has like hackers in a room. 
And so when people are scrolling through their feed, this video auto plays and it looks really cool. And when they click on it, it takes them to my article. So some of that helps propagate my articles by having this really eye-catching content in their Twitter feeds, but then push them over to long form. Later down the road, I'm like, okay, I've got this big audience I'm building on Twitter, LinkedIn. What am I doing with this long-term? Like I've got this audience, um, how do I stay resilient? And also, you know, kind of lean, uh, there's a while where I hadn't, I didn't, I didn't write like an article for like a year. There it was kind of a point until I started my newsletter again, um, to where, you know, it was writing an article is a lot of time. And mm -hmm. I just felt like I was kind of, I had kind of covered all the topics I wanted to cover. And that's where the held report felt really fresh to me. I was like, this is like Dan's not weekly insights, but more of like weekly thoughts or meditations combined with like a longer form narrative. So it's not just, Hey, what happened this week? It's like my take on various Bitcoin topics, but maybe with like, if something happens and I think it's really critical that I cover it like wall street bets and when wall street bets with AMC and yeah. you know, when that happened, I felt that that was very analogous to like Bitcoin's rebellious spirit. Totally. So that, that's, that's where, where yeah, yeah, I reported where, on that. Yeah. But then I might cover stuff like this week is going to be around how to manage your private keys. Um, and that one, I think, is a, a topic that we're all take a little bit of a controversial stance where a lot of Bitcoiners are very dogmatic about like self-custody. Anyways, th that'll be kind of a fun one. But yeah, they kind of they go between like evergreen content and kind of topical like what's happened this last week. I've got this audience I'm building. What do I do with this audience? How do I empower them? How do I, how do I lean into this? And uh, two new channels popped up, newsletter and YouTube. So I pulled my Twitter followers and I said, where else do you learn about Bitcoin? YouTube was the number one spot. So I'm like, okay, there's a big audience over on YouTube that I should go tap into. So I reached out to the top crypto YouTubers and I'm like, hey, how do you build great YouTube videos? And they gave me their tips and tricks. Wow. I used some of those to build out and inform my own policy, like how, or not my policy, but my, my formatting and structure. I mean, my YouTube video, I literally just screen share my newsletter. <laughs> I, I mean, it's just me on camera, but then I screen share. So one side of the screen is, is the screen share. It's not that high quality content. The content bar is actually pretty low, but I get more engagement than some of the top crypto YouTube channels, which is crazy. Yeah. There's clearly an appetite for this information. I mean, and just in the last year, I think what's fascinating about the pandemic is it got a lot of people investing in the stock market for the first time, but with the massive bull market and this massive rally of Bitcoin, it's all these people coming in who know nothing about it. I mean, I have friends that have invested and they literally don't know what blockchain is. They don't know how Bitcoin works. They don't know what it is. They don't even know what they bought. They just know, hey, I, I heard that it's going to hit a million someday. And I find that so fascinating because if you do learn about it, the technology, like the thought process behind it is so brilliant. Like the system that was created is such brilliant sound money that could make all of our lives better, which is what fascinated me. And I love the book, the book, the Bitcoin standard. Um, I just wish that more people would learn about it, which is hopefully, you know, hopefully the point of this podcast will inspire people to do that. Yeah. I think, um, you know, that's what I felt that there was a gap in the content and you're totally right. Me finding traction with my content means people like it. <laughs> that's, that's it. I don't make my content. I make content my audience wants, yeah. which is, which are people getting that are just entering, hearing about Bitcoin and some Bitcoiners. And this is the value that I bring to Bitcoin is I, I'm good at succinctly compressing the narrative, which I learned over at Uber and distilling topics into very digestible pieces. Um, now, increasingly more and more folks are coming in who are good at this too. Um, you know, Nick Carter is a phenomenal thought leader. He's so great. Um, same with Peter McCormick and others. And there's going to be, you know, in this bull run, we're going to see more and more folks come in that are great content creators and great uh, storytellers. Um, to where I didn't really consider myself that great at all. <laughs> I didn't really consider myself a public speaker or a writer, but I put the content out. People liked it. And I was like, you know what? Maybe the bar that I had for content creation was too high. Maybe the bar was actually really low. And I, I just, I never thought I could do it because I always had higher expectations for myself than what the market had for content. You know, similar to how we talked about with Uber and all my career trajectory, just kind of saying yes to opportunity and just figuring it out as I go. You know, a lot of that, uh, when we talk about like content is the same thing. I didn't go through formal writing. I don't consider myself a writer, but I wrote content and people liked it. And that's all that's that matters, matters. Yeah. Um, which was a pretty fun experience, but very daunting at the same time. I mean, you are with writing, you are putting yourself out there on a pedestal for the whole world to criticize. And if you make like a misspelling, 
someone will screenshot it on Twitter and they might get 500 likes on it. Right. Yeah. Like we're talking, it's pretty brutal, like brutal, brutal. Um, but it's pretty rewarding. I, but I think it's rewarding in terms of like seeing how it, when I hear people's stories of like, Dan, your article helped get my dad into Bitcoin. Like that's, that's what I live for. Those are the moments I live for, you know, it's, um, I, I think that's what makes me the happiest is moments of hearing like that. And, you know, Michael Saylor said I was critical uh, for his understanding of Bitcoin. Yeah. And I think that was a hugely rewarding moment too. Cause I see these masses of like, Oh, I've got 160,000 followers. And then you see this engage, like I got 7,000 likes on a tweet, but then you forget that like, no, you're actually changing people's minds one by one, but at this huge scale. And you don't think about it until you get that email, you know, cause my emails are open. I get that email and I'm like, Oh, this is awesome. Like this actually impacted someone's life. Um, yeah. So it, those moments are so cool. And, and especially for how, what the promise Bitcoin brings, this isn't like getting them into a new startup or something. This is like a whole new revolution. This is one of the biggest movements in humankind history. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. Like if we win, which I'm pretty sure we will, if we win, I mean, this will be one of the biggest revolutions ever in human history. Like it's going to be crazy. I, I love all the excitement. Like Bitcoin Twitter is my favorite aspect of Twitter. So um, before we start to wrap up, I just want to ask you a few very Bitcoin centric questions um, for people who really don't have a, a ton of knowledge in this space, or maybe some of the people that are our parents, or maybe even young people that are in school right now and are racked with student debt. What's like the biggest thing you want people to know, or what's the what's the elevator pitch for Bitcoin? The elevator pitch for Bitcoin would be that Bitcoin represents your a new type of store of value asset that is censorship resistant and that is hard to seize. So those are the two value props. Um, tactically, what that means for a person is that this is like a gold. You can go bury it in the backyard. Very few people are going to know you have it. It's great that you have it because you can leave with it if you need to, if you need to flee your country or if you're in a bad situation. Um, no one else can take this away from you because when you hold it, you are the bearer of that asset. You own it and you bear, you know, whoever holds it or bears it owns it. And Bitcoin, so it's just like gold in terms of its value props. Of course, Bitcoin is much more advantageous than gold. You can transmit it across the world in a second. It's divisible. It's got many other, and auditable. It's got many other properties that make it more advantageous. Um, for people who are struggling with their own finances, you know, I, I, uh, you know, first and foremost, I think like, financial education is totally, and after, if we succeed with Bitcoin, maybe that's something I'll get into is talking about financial education, the basics, like saving and, and stuff like that, where, you know, stacking sats, I think was such a great meme of, of encouraging and teaching people about saving. But what's so cool about this type of saving is that you're immediately, you're, you know, you're rewarded rather, relatively shortly with huge gains, wow. which reward you for that saving. You know, even, I think even if you're struggling financially, you can still carve out time to put a little bit of money into Bitcoin, putting that money in, but even if it's 20 bucks, 20 bucks, 50 bucks, I know everyone's got 20 bucks laying around. You can, you can find 20 bucks. It'll force you to start thinking about it. And that's actually how I approach other investments is I put a little bit of money into it because now I'm going to open up Robinhood. Now I'm going to open up something else to go read about it because now I've got my, like, Oh, I wonder what the price is today. Yeah. That sticky habit building loop will bring you back into Bitcoin and learn more and more about it. So buy a tiny bit of it. Even if it's 20 bucks, you know, it's a little, little tiny bit. It'll force you to want to learn more. Um, it's a technique I use. It works wonders. Do you believe in the stock to flow chart and the price predictions that it gives? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I just recently interviewed plan B who, who created the stock to flow model. Look, I think, you know, he even says that like, this doesn't completely describe all that's going on. He's just looking at the supply side of things. You know, there's of course the demand side of the equation as well. What's weird is that the model works. <laughs> I think that's what's so bizarre about it is like, we all admit there's flaws in it. He even himself admits there's flaws in the modeling. And anyone who's ever built a model knows that you can't predict the future. So, right. you know, it's not possible to predict the future. Otherwise you'd be a trillionaire. You would just go invest everything you had into a single bet or buy a call option and yellow it <laughs> and you make a trillion <laughs> dollars, right? Yeah. So with, um, you know, a stock to flow, What's weird about it is that it's been proven right <laughs> over the last couple of years, which is mind blowing. Um, but I think, you know, fundamentally, like when people quantitatively look at these models, they're like, okay, well, you know, we quant, you know, we're doing all this quant work with like crunching the numbers, we're like calculating all these things. Qualitatively, it explains every, uh, the stock to flow model is very easily, easily explainable with qualitative reasoning. 
less supply, more demand, price goes up. You know, it's not, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's the TLDR of stock to flow. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a TLDR and that intuitively makes sense. Um, now, certainly Bitcoin's adoption curve could stagnate if less and less people believe in it or flat lines, right? So there is an element of the demand side where yes, supply decreased, but where does the, the increase in demand come from? You know, and that's where what's really interesting though is a lot of people discount the supply decrease as just like, oh, that's irrelevant to demand, but it's not because let's say that 10 Bitcoin a day are being bought by miners. So the miners are mining 10 Bitcoin and 10 Bitcoin are being bought from the miners by consumers who want to buy Bitcoin. Well, let's say that that is now reduced to five Bitcoin. You still have the same 10 BTC demand daily that's there to buy it. And so demand is outstripping supply, which causes the price to go up, which then causes awareness to increase because the price goes up. People become aware of it then they buy an expectation of it going higher, AKA FOMO. And so the decrease in supply actually can induce demand. And that's where I think people are like, oh, you just know one side of the equation, the supply side, but you don't know anything about demand. But in this circumstance, I do think they're intertwined, which is a beautiful thing to where decreases in supply can actually stoke demand um, through this price uh, viral loop mechanism, which is wild stuff. And again, any model is can't predict the future. So that's where I think like, it's not really about the data itself. It's more about the qualitative reasoning around why would it go up after a halving? And it goes up because supply, the, the amount of fresh supply hitting the market has decreased and that price acts as a viral loop. Why don't you think there's more Michael Saylors out there? I, I mean, obviously the institutions are coming in and we do see a headline here or there, but I mean, why haven't the Facebooks and you know the Googles bought Bitcoin yet? Well, uh, Saylor had a conference where he had, I think over 700 uh, folks come, uh, 700 companies participate. Wait, it was higher than that. It's like a 3,000, I think was actually the number. And that was a few months ago. It takes a long time for corporations to get buy-in internally with their board and with others to go buy Bitcoin and put it on their balance sheet. So I think we're going to see a wave of companies announce it in the next couple months, but it definitely took a guy like Saylor to risk it, to de-risk it from a career perspective. Same with the uh, macro traders. On the macro trader front, those were some of the first institutions to come buy Bitcoin or recommend it. And as soon as a few big names got in, then the floodgates opened where the rest of the macro folks piled in. And so Elon uh, and Saylor were kind of the first wave. Now the floodgates are open where every single corporation, now those these talks take months, things like corporations take a long time. So, and then they don't report their, their financials very often, just quarterly. Right. So it's gonna take some time to show up, but I think we're gonna see a whole wave come out here soon. Can you explain what your super cycle theory is? Yeah, so the basics of it are that Bitcoin had multiple bull bear markets in the past, so different cycles, and those were predominantly driven by retail traders. With this new cycle, it's being driven by institutions that rec that uh, invest $100 trillion globally. These institutions also bring pedigree and validation that retail traders look at to make decisions. If Goldman, all these big companies say Bitcoin is valid, then retail buys. So. We're seeing, you know, Bitcoin only has 21 million Bitcoin. That hasn't changed. And we're seeing a whole lot more demand about to hit. Now, some people go, well, this will look like all the previous Bitcoin cycles where it goes up a lot, then drops 80% in the bear market. But I'm like, I don't think so with this, this time, because in this time we have COVID. COVID highlighted why Bitcoin is valuable. And you have the institutions validating Bitcoin. Bitcoin isn't trying to become relevant. It has become, it like isn't trying to become relevant. It has become relevant. And when this happens and the whole world recognizes Bitcoin's value, it's not just going to be a quick pump and dump. It's going to be the whole world flowing and trying to get into Bitcoin as they're escaping these government policies and escaping inflation. And that's not going to be a typical cycle. I don't know what it's going to be. And that's where the super, super cycle theory comes out is we could either see the whole world wake up to Bitcoin at the same time. Like what if everyone rushes in in the next six months, like every corporation and every sovereign wealth fund and every hedge fund and every retail trader, like the price isn't going to do a normal cycle. It's going to go nuts. Conversely, I could be too bullish, um, you know, and we don't see that play out, but we could also see something where we have a normal bull run and just a very, very mild winter where people, you know, people would now recognize Bitcoin as a global store of value. And the price wasn't that speculative. It was just, it went up and then went flat maybe, or went up and just dipped a little bit. 
So all I'm saying is that I think this time will be different based on a lot of factors outside of the Bitcoin protocol, who's adopting it, why they're adopting it, and what's happening in the global markets. You know, obviously there are a lot of critics out there and it, we don't know for sure what's going to happen. We can't predict the future. What are scenarios in which Bitcoin fails or what what's something that, you know, concerns you about Bitcoin's scaling and growth? Yeah, I mean, I, I consider these very low likelihood scenarios, but like you could have governments really take a concentrated effort to, to attack it. The problem is they're not going to take it seriously enough until it's too big, you know, until it's 20 to 30 percent of the population, five to 10 trillion market cap. And at that point, it becomes really hard to stop. So I do think that some of them might, as we saw in India, um, but I find that a very low likelihood, but that would be a, probably the biggest threat that Bitcoin has. And that's why Bitcoin has been constructed the way that it has is to survive state level attacks. Um, so that would be like number one. Number two might be like a protocol flaw. Now, granted, you know, if something happens like that, that's not the end of Bitcoin. Um, we can simply say, we can simply fix the problem be like, after this moment, you know, we're just, this is the moment in the sand where that we're going to reverse back to. It's not the ideal situation, obviously, and, um, you know, violates some of the core principles of having a blockchain. But, uh, you know, if a protocol flaw occurs, that's not the Bitcoin community deciding to rewind the transaction. That's because the rules of the system broke. Um, and, and the whole community agrees that because the rules broke, it's fine to move it back. And the rules are that, like, you know, you can't print more than 21 million Bitcoin. You can't do this or that. So, a protocol flaw, which is also increasingly becoming rare um, and also you know, very likely to be more mild. And that's why it's good that Bitcoin doesn't change very often, which means that more potential flaws aren't going to be introduced all the time. Um, that could also be an issue. But even in a scenario, it's not the death of Bitcoin. It's simply that you can fix it. And, and it would just the coordination of that would be very difficult and would also be kind of a mess. But Bitcoin would survive. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Coin Stories. I'd love to connect with you if you have questions or guest requests, so feel free to get in touch on Twitter at Nat Brunel or Instagram at Natalie Brunel. Take care till next time.